Back when I was nine, the world as I knew it shifted in ways I couldn't have anticipated. My mom had left us too soon, leaving a gaping hole in our lives that dad and I tried to patch up in our clumsy, grief-stricken ways. Life had its rhythm, a sad, monotonous beat that we followed until dad decided to introduce a new melody, her name was Linda. One evening, dad sat me down at the kitchen table, his hands fidgeting with the coffee mug mom used to love. Clara, I want you to meet someone special tomorrow. Her name's Linda, and she's, well, she's a friend of mine, he said, avoiding my eyes. Why, dad? Who is she? My curiosity peaked but a knot formed in my stomach. Something about the way he wouldn't meet my gaze told me this was more than just a friend. Dad sighed, a weary sound. I just think it's time, pumpkin. We, we need to start finding ways to be happy again. The next day, Linda stepped into our home, her presence filling the space with an unfamiliar energy. She was all smiles and sweetness, extending a hand adorned with shiny rings. Hello, Clara. I've heard so much about you, she said, her voice syrupy sweet. I shook her hand, feeling the coldness of her touch. Hi, I muttered, eyeing her warily. As dad showed her around, I trailed behind, watching as her gaze swept over our living room. When her eyes landed on the family photos, particularly the ones of mom, her smile faltered, replaced by a fleeting look of disdain. I saw it, even if dad didn't. Months flew by, and before I knew it, Linda had transitioned from dad's friend to dad's wife. Her real colors began to show, not in bold, overt strokes, but in subtle shades of manipulation and pretense. One night at dinner, dad brought up the subject of my outgrown wardrobe. Clara's been growing like a weed. We need to get her some new clothes for school, he mentioned casually. Linda jumped at the opportunity. Oh, let me handle that. I love shopping, and I'll make sure Clara gets the best, she offered, her tone dripping with feigned enthusiasm. A week later, Linda unveiled her shopping spree results with a flourish. The clothes were laughable. Everything was several sizes too big, hanging off my shoulders and pooling at my feet. Look at this, darling. I got everything on sale, and she'll grow into them. It's perfect. Linda exclaimed, holding up a dress that could double as a tent. Dad beamed at her, proud and grateful. Linda, that's brilliant. So thoughtful of you. I tried to protest. But Dad, they're too big. I'll look silly. Linda cut me off, her voice laced with a honeyed tone that bordered on patronizing. Oh, sweetie, it's better this way. Kids your age grow so fast. Plus, we're saving money for more important things. I felt my cheeks burn with humiliation. The next day at school was as bad as I feared. Hey, Scarecrow, where's the rest of the barn? The taunts rang out, each word a needle to my already bruised heart. I came home that day, my spirit as tattered as the oversized clothes I was drowning in. I tried to explain to Dad how the other kids were making fun of me, but Linda was always there a step ahead, smoothing over the cracks with her sweet lies. Oh, Clara, I'm sure they're just jealous. You look lovely, and remember, we're being smart about our choices, she said, her hand resting falsely on mine. Dad nodded, agreeing with her. Linda's right, pumpkin. It's all about being smart. After the whole close fiasco, things didn't get any better. Linda, my stepmom, was playing her role to the hilt, fooling everyone with her act of kindness. To the outside world, she was the epitome of a caring mother, but behind closed doors, it was a whole different story. One evening, while Dad was late at work, Linda decided to help me with my homework. Clara, let's get this math done, shall we? She said, her voice dripping with fake sweetness. I wasn't keen on the idea, knowing well how her help usually turned out. I've got it, Linda. Really? I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. Nonsense. She insisted, pulling a chair up beside me. As she leaned over to see my workbook, her criticisms began. Clara, dear, this is all wrong. How have you not grasped this yet? It's simple arithmetic. 
Her words stung, more so, because I knew my math was right. I double-checked it, Linda. It matches the examples in the textbook. I defended myself, my frustration growing. Linda tooted, shaking her head. You must have misunderstood the textbook, then. Here, let me show you the right way. She proceeded to correct my work, effectively making it all wrong. The next day, when my math teacher reviewed my homework, I got a lecture in front of the whole class about double-checking my work. Humiliated, I couldn't even explain that it wasn't my fault. That evening, I tried to tell Dad about it. Dad, Linda messed up my math homework on purpose, I said, hoping he'd see reason. Dad, tired from work, just sighed. Clara, Linda's trying to help you. Maybe you're not seeing her efforts. Then came the parent-teacher conference. Linda insisted on going with Dad. I want to be involved in Clara's education, she declared, playing the devoted stepmother part perfectly. At the conference, Linda was all charm, laughing, and chatting with my teachers. We're so grateful for all your hard work with Clara. We know she can be a challenge, but we're all in this together, she said, laying it on thick. The worst part was the way Linda volunteered for every school event, painting herself as the martyr, taking on the burden of a stepchild with grace and love. It's the least I can do for poor Clara, she'd tell other parents, her voice laced with feigned concern. After all, she's been through so much with her mother's passing. And they bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Linda was the saint, and I was just the troubled kid, ungrateful for the love and care she showered on me. One evening, I decided I couldn't stomach another dinner, acting like everything was okay. Linda had made some casserole, the kind she knew I didn't like, yet insisted I eat, because it was her specialty. Clara, can you set the table, please? Dad asked as he walked into the kitchen, oblivious to the tension. I don't see why I should. Let Linda do it, I retorted, my voice sharper than I intended. Linda, feigning surprise and hurt, clasped her hands together. Oh, I just thought you'd like to help out, Clara. I made your favorite. I snorted, unable to contain my disdain. Since when is anything you make my favorite? Dad's face fell, a mix of disappointment and confusion. Clara, that's no way to speak to Linda. She's trying. Trying to make my life miserable, more like, I muttered under my breath, but loud enough for both of them to hear. The dinner that followed was a disaster. Each bite of the casserole tasted like defeat, and Linda's attempts at conversation felt like she was taunting me. After a few minutes of pushing food around my plate, I stood up, my chair scraping loudly against the floor. I'm not hungry, I announced, ready to escape the suffocating atmosphere. Before I could leave, Linda's voice stopped me. Clara, your attitude lately has been very concerning. Maybe it's time we implement more, structured discipline. Dad, always the peacemaker, sighed. Clara, we just want what's best for you. What's best for me, or for her? I challenged, gesturing towards Linda. Because it seems like you're only listening to her side of things. It ended with me being grounded, confined to my room with the only company being my thoughts and a growing resentment. Life with Linda turned every day into a battlefield, but the war escalated quickly after my open defiance at dinner. Every little slip-up, every minor mistake, was suddenly evidence of my rebellious nature or bad character. Linda had a knack for twisting things, making it seem like I was always at fault, and Dad. Dad just went along with it. One afternoon, after spilling a glass of juice in the kitchen, a simple accident that could happen to anyone, I braced myself for the inevitable. Linda swooped in like a hawk, her eyes glinting with an almost gleeful condemnation. Look at this mess. Clara, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Carelessness. It's just like your mother. Linda's voice trailed off, but the implication hung heavy in the air. I felt my face flush with anger. Mentioning mom was a low blow, even for Linda. Don't you dare talk about my mom. You're nothing like her. Dad, hearing the commotion, rushed in, his expression weary. What's all this? 
Clara, apologized to Linda. It was just an accident. I will not. I shot back, my voice rising. She's always blaming me, saying I'm careless, saying I'm bad, just like, like mom was. But she's wrong. Dad's face hardened, a rare sight. Clara, that's enough. Linda's only trying to help. She cares about you. Cares about me? The thought was laughable. I turned to dad, my voice cracking with emotion. How can you say that? She's always on my case, pretending to be the perfect wife and stepmom in front of you. But she's not. And you, you never listen to me. Later, when the house was quiet, and I had time to think, I realized the toll it was taking on me. My confidence, my sense of self, it was all eroding under Linda's relentless criticism. It wasn't just about fighting back anymore, it was about preserving who I was, who my mom had hoped I'd be. Life at home had settled into a tense routine. I was getting better at dodging Linda's barbs, keeping my head down to avoid confrontation. Then, one ordinary, unremarkable Tuesday, everything changed. Dad didn't come down for breakfast, which was odd. He was always up before everyone, a habit from years of early morning starts at his job. I decided to check on him, thinking maybe he needed a sick day, something he never took. The moment I opened the door to their room, I knew. It was too quiet, the kind of silence that presses down on you, heavy with dread. Dad? My voice was barely a whisper, my feet rooted to the spot. He was there, lying so still, too still. Panic gripped me as I rushed to his side, my hands shaking as I reached out to him. Dad, please, I begged, the reality of the situation crashing down on me. Linda came in after, her scream piercing the thick veil of disbelief that had settled over me. The next few hours were a blur, ambulances, hushed voices, sympathetic looks. The verdict was a heart attack, sudden and without warning. Then came the funeral, a surreal procession of events that I moved through like a ghost. Linda was there, of course, playing the part of the grieving widow, to perfection. Her tears were convincing, her sobs heart-wrenching. But to me, they sounded hollow, an echo of the genuine grief that weighed down my heart. I just can't believe he's gone. She wailed to anyone who would listen. He was my everything, and now, now I have to take care of Clara all on my own. How will I manage? Her words, meant to elicit sympathy, only fueled my anger. Manage? As if I was nothing more than a burden, a problem to be solved. I wanted to shout, to tell her to stop her charade, but I remained silent, my grief a heavy shackle around my heart. After the funeral, the house felt emptier than I ever thought possible. The silence was oppressive, a constant reminder of the void dad's death had left in our lives. It was during one of these long, quiet afternoons that Linda decided to show her true colors once again. We were sitting in the living room, the air thick with unsaid things, when Linda turned to me, her eyes cold and calculating. Well, Clara, it's just us now. She began, her voice, deceptively soft. And things are going to change around here. I stiffened, wary of her tone. What do you mean? Linda smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. You see, with your father gone, I'm your guardian now. And that means I'm in charge of you, and your inheritance. My heart sank. I had almost forgotten about the money dad left behind, too caught up in my grief to consider the implications. What about it? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Oh, sweetie, don't worry. I'll take good care of it. After all, it's what your father would have wanted she said, her tone dripping with faux concern. The implications of her words hit me like a ton of bricks. Linda in control of my life and my inheritance was the last thing dad would have wanted. You can't do that. That money is mine. I protested, my anger rising. Linda's smile widened, a hint of malice creeping into her expression. Actually, I can. And I will. You're just a child, Clara. What do you know about handling money, about the real world? No, I'll be the one making the decisions from now on. And as for you, she paused, leaning in closer, you'd better learn your place and how to show some respect. 
or else, your life is going to become very difficult. After the threats and the declaration of a twisted sort of guardianship from Linda, I knew I couldn't just sit back and let her run rampant over my life and my inheritance. It was time to fight back, but I needed an ally, someone who could help me navigate the legal and emotional battlefield I found myself in. That's when I thought of Aunt Sarah, Dad's sister. She'd always been kind to me, and I remembered Dad saying how much she'd helped him through tough times. I picked up the phone, my hands shaking as I dialed Aunt Sarah's number. It rang three times before she answered. Hello? Aunt Sarah, it's me, Clara. Clara, how are you, honey? I've been so worried about you. I took a deep breath, steadying my nerves. I'm not good, Aunt Sarah. I, I need your help. It's Linda. She's. The words tumbled out in a rush, all my fears, my frustrations, and Linda's threats, pouring out into the open. Aunt Sarah was silent for a moment, and when she spoke again, her voice was firm, determined. I had my suspicions about her, Clara. Your dad was blinded by grief. Tell me everything, and we'll figure out a plan. I spent the next hour talking to Aunt Sarah, telling her about the oversized clothes, the fake kindness that fooled everyone but me, and, most importantly, Linda's plans for my inheritance. By the time we hung up, a seed of hope had been planted. Aunt Sarah promised she'd look into how she could become my legal guardian and protect me from Linda's grasp. The next morning, Aunt Sarah arrived, her presence in the house like a beacon of hope. Linda eyed her warily, sensing a shift in the balance of power but not yet understanding its source. Aunt Sarah wasted no time. Linda, we need to talk. It's about Clara. Linda folded her arms, a fake smile plastered on her face. What about her? It's simple. You're not suited to be her guardian. I'm taking legal steps to assume guardianship of Clara. Linda's smile faltered, her eyes narrowing. You can't do that. I'm her stepmother. I have rights. I finally spoke up, my voice stronger than I felt. I want to live with Aunt Sarah. I don't want to be here with you anymore, Linda. Linda laughed at that, a harsh, grating sound that echoed mockingly in the living room. You think you've got a say in this, do you? You're just a kid. Your opinion doesn't matter here. That's when Aunt Sarah stepped in, her voice icy with resolve. Actually, it does. Clara is 14. According to the law, she's old enough to decide who she wants to live with. And she's chosen me. The day the court ruled in Aunt Sarah's favor was the first day of the rest of my life. I moved in with her immediately, leaving Linda and her manipulations behind. Aunt Sarah didn't just become my guardian, she became my mom in every way that mattered. She officially adopted me not long after, solidifying what we already knew to be true in our hearts. One evening, Aunt Sarah and I were sitting on the porch, watching the sunset paint the sky in shades of orange and pink. We'd been talking about school, about my future, when she turned to me, her expression thoughtful. Clara, you know you've got a whole world of possibilities ahead of you, right? She said, taking a sip of her tea. I shrugged, the weight of the past few years, making it hard to see too far into the future. I guess. I just don't know where to start. Aunt Sarah set her tea down, turning to face me fully. Start with what you love. Remember, you've got your whole life to figure it out, but now's the time to explore, to try new things. Her words stirred something in me, a spark of ambition that Linda had almost smothered. I've always liked numbers, you know? Math, puzzles, that sort of thing. I admitted, feeling a bit shy about revealing my dream. Aunt Sarah's face lit up. That's fantastic, Clara. You know, there's a lot you can do with that. Accounting, engineering, economics, the sky's the limit. Economics, I repeated, the word feeling right. I like the sound of that. From that moment, Aunt Sarah was my biggest cheerleader. She helped me enroll in courses that would prepare me for a college degree in economics, supporting my dream with a zeal that was both encouraging and a bit overwhelming at times. The day I got accepted into college with a scholarship in economics, Aunt Sarah threw a little party, 
just the two of us, complete with a homemade banner and a cake that leans slightly to the left. Look at you, future economist in the making! She exclaimed, her eyes misty with proud tears. I laughed, hugging her tight. I couldn't have done it without you, Aunt Sarah. You saved me, in more ways than one. She hugged me back, just as tightly. We saved each other, kiddo. Remember that. We're a team. And she was right. Together, we'd turned a new page, stepping into a future that was bright with promise. Life with Aunt Sarah wasn't just a new dawn, it was my true beginning. Years had rolled by since the days of living under the same roof with Linda. I had built a life for myself, working as an economist at a reputable company, and had recently taken the plunge and bought a small apartment on a mortgage. It was my sanctuary, a cozy nook in the hustle of the city that I proudly called mine. Life was good, uncomplicated, and mine to enjoy. That was until the day the past decided to make an unexpected comeback. The call came on an ordinary Thursday afternoon. I was at my desk, buried in reports and forecasts, when my phone buzzed with a number I didn't recognize. Is this Clara Harrison? The voice on the other end was formal, almost sterile. Yes, speaking, who's this? I'm calling from City General Hospital. Your mother is in our hospital. She's asking for your help. A jolt of confusion hit me. I think there's been a mistake. My mother passed away years ago. After a brief pause, the caller clarified. You'll excuse me. It's not your mother, Miss Harrison. It's your stepmother, Linda. Hearing Linda's name after all these years was like being doused with cold water. A mix of emotions swirled within me, surprise, skepticism, and an undeniable curiosity. What's wrong with her? She's been hospitalized for a serious condition. She's asking to see you. Taking a deep breath, I found myself agreeing to visit. All right, I'll come by after work. I found Linda, in a shared ward, a shadow of the formidable woman I remembered. The gloss and veneer that she always presented to the world were gone, leaving behind a frail figure that barely resembled my stepmother. As I approached, her eyes found me, and a flicker of something, relief, perhaps, crossed her face. Clara, she croaked, her voice, barely above a whisper. You actually came. I took a chair by the bed keeping my emotions carefully neutral. The hospital called. Said you wanted to see me. She exhaled, a sound filled with defeat. I, I squandered everything. Your father's money, it's all gone. And now, I'm here, with nothing. I need help, Clara. For treatment, and rehab. Sitting there, in the cold, sterile light of the hospital room, a flood of memories washed over me. All those years under Linda's roof, the subtle jabs, the manipulation, the way she made me feel like an outsider in my own home, it all came crashing back. She was asking for help now, but back then, would she have lifted a finger for me? The answer was as clear as the disdain in her eyes whenever she looked at me. I remember everything, Linda, I said, my voice steady, a reflection of the strength I'd forged from those years of strife. All the times you could have helped me, but chose not to. Why should I help you now? Linda's facade of vulnerability shattered in an instant, her eyes narrowing as her true colors bled through. You ungrateful little brat, she hissed. I took you in when I didn't have to. You owe me. I'm your mother, by law. You have to help me, or I'll sue you. I'll take every penny you've got. I couldn't help it, laughter bubbled up from within me echoing off the sterile walls. The absurdity of her threat, the desperation, it was all too much. Sue me? For what? Aunt Sarah adopted me, remember? Legally, you're nothing to me now. A stranger. The realization hit Linda like a physical blow, her face contorting in anger and disbelief. She launched into a tirade, a mix of threats and pleading, but her words no longer held any power over me. They were just the last, pathetic attempts of a woman who'd lost control. I looked at her, really looked at her, and saw nothing but a sad, broken figure, clinging to delusions of entitlement. I'm not your daughter, Linda. Not by blood, 
and certainly not by law. You made sure of that a long time ago. Turning on my heel, I left the room, her shouts of rage and despair fading with each step I took. The weight of the past, the burden of her presence in my life, it all seemed to lift, leaving a clear path ahead. Outside, the world seemed brighter, the air fresher. I took a deep breath, savoring the freedom, the closure. Linda was my past, a chapter finally closed, and I was the author of my future, writing my story one step at a time on my own terms.